perfect song. Good morning. Good morning. Boy, did we get ourselves mixed up in something, right? <laughs> Is it this? I'll just turn it off while I'm not using it. Um, and I say we got ourselves mixed into something as we've decided to um, see what it's like to play in the same sandbox together, right? <laughs> see if we can treat each other with extraordinary respect and also enjoy some of the challenges that come from coming together in community. Community is never about it's all joy. It isn't. We come together in spiritual community for reasons that might be connection, it's home, but ultimately the bigger purpose of spiritual community is to grow, and to grow into a knowing of who we truly are. If you could put up that first slide for me. Um, Emma Curtis Hopkins, I call her the queen of denial. <laughs> she was the one that sort of created that idea of denying first within prayer, which is not true. Ergo, queen of denial. She said that we thought that sickness was something sent by God, and truth is a healing principle, not a sickening principle. I have had one interesting week, and whenever you hear me from this moment forward say interesting, I'm not sure what it is yet. <laughs> like, I know it's really good, and then some of it I haven't really kind of uh, absorbed at a point of understanding, but I know that I will, so I call it interesting because I really don't like to commit to anything <laughs> with respect to what I'm learning, because I think I know what I'm learning, and then I go, oh yeah, it's not that at all. Now, how many of you uh, have a story that you tell regularly, maybe, even if it's once a year, and you've told that story in the same way since the beginning? Yeah. What's interesting in this movement is one of the things that we do, I, am, I do it too, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Um, but what happens often is we tell a story over and over and over. It places us in a particular place within the story. And oftentimes, the story either puts us as a hero or a victim in the story, right? And in many cases, what we do here in these rooms across the world is we challenge stories. And we challenge them because the more that we look at that we don't really remember things accurately. We don't. Our brain isn't designed to collect data and remember it in a factual way. It collects factual data and it interprets it. And we interpret our stories based upon what we've gone through, sort of the subtotal of our collective experiences and our interpretations of them. Now, this last week I found out some information that, had great, that could have potentially had great effect on my family. And it was disturbing at first. And I was really upset about it. And as I started to go into a little bit of the story of what I, what the, how this affected me per particularly in, and personally, um, fortunately, I was paying attention to what I was doing. And in the beginning, I needed to kind of take some space and to go off and actually just be in it and really see how I felt about it and how, where did I put myself in it. One of the things we first did, my spouse and I, is we decided to go sit with a counselor and talk through the situation to see what it really meant. Now, what did I just do? I, I identified that quite possibly the story I'm carrying isn't completely accurate. Because probably not. <laughs> and so, through the week, as we've been dealing with this, what ended up popping up throughout the whole week was Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> and there's a quote in, the, you know, Alice in Wonderland was written by Lewis Carroll, and he actually wrote four different books. And when he originally wrote the first book, um, it was for a little girl named Alice Lettle. And it was a real, she was a real character in his life. 
She was one of three daughters um, at a, a Christian university that we, he was at in Oxford. At the time, it was Christian. And his real name, Lewis Carroll, was Charles Dobson. He wrote under the pen name Lewis Carroll for whatever reason. He did not want that to be known as the author. And he was a mathematician, and interestingly, he had a speech impediment. He had a special relationship with Alice Liddell, and she was um, the middle child. And during the time, and he was a single man, so to have a special relationship with little girls at this day and age would seem a little odd, wouldn't it? And we'd be a little cautious about it. But what's interesting is he loved these little girls. We'll go with that for today. And he told them, little, told them stories. And one day, he took them out on a boat. And he told the story of the adventures of Alice in Wonderland. And Alice, little Alice, begged him to write the stories. He was rather creative. And what was interesting that made him really creative was that he suffered from a rare neurological disorder that causes strange hallucinations and effects about the size of virtual objects. It can make the person that's dealing with it feel bigger or smaller than they actually are. And if you've read Alice in Wonderland, it's a key component of the story itself. Now, what's important to know about the story, so I'm going to just kind of refer to this story because it has a lot of amazing logical, uh, he, he in, weaves in logic and metaphor throughout the story. In the second book, which is Alice Through the Looking Glass, he's creating a story that when you actually read through Alice in the Looking Glass, it is a pretty scary book. A scary book in the sense that He's trying to illustrate and or represent the, the life of children and how oftentimes adults can be quite frightening. I still think that. <laughs> and, he, and if you look at some of the characters in Alice in the Looking Glass or Alice in, uh, and her adventures in Wonderland, those characters are a little bit uh, crazy, would you say? Yeah. And but what's interesting about it is they're not that different from a lot of us and how we behave and how we operate in the world when we're afraid or we, in essence, live from a particular story. In one part of the book, Alice is talking to the queen, and it's the Red Queen. And she says, and Alice laughed, there's no use trying, she said, one can't believe impossible things. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the queen. When I was your age, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. What's interesting, here's this queen, this adult. Can you imagine an adult saying that? No. And here's Alice, which was based on the real character, who was described, Alice Liddell, as feisty and challenging and stubborn and very confident within herself. And that character was represented throughout the four books of Alice in Wonderland. Stories have such power in our lives. And if our stories don't change, trans transcend us, help transcend us, if our stories stay the same, that doesn't mean that there aren't facts in stories that are true. But it's not always true, the story that we tell. And if, you look, if we look at how we tell a story and we look at how we position ourselves in that story, it tells a lot about what we believe about ourselves. Um, Lewis Carroll sort of saw Alice as in living in a world of adults that were peculiar and odd. And here he was, an adult himself. And he tried to represent that. But what we know is you can't take anything in the world, no matter what is expressed, at face value. None of our stories can be assumed true at face value. It's why curiosity is so important when we hear stories and or when we even tell our own stories. You see, because we're an imperfect witness to truth. Just feel that a little bit. 
Whenever I place myself in a position of being victim to anything in this world, then I am telling a story that somehow I have no power. And I would say truly those that are probably the only victims in our world, truly, at least let's just look, I'm just going to be very simplistic about it, are children and the elderly. The elderly in, elderly that are being cared for. That are in assisted living or wherever they might be, where they rely on others for the most simplest of care. Our memories inform our present, but memories are but interpretation of facts. And we become actually weaker when there are stories, let me back up, whenever there's a situation or a story we tell, and something in the story tells us to avoid a particular circumstance, event, situation, and or person, we actually are training our brain to weaken there's been neurological studies done on the fact that if we avoid things that we're afraid of, that our brain continues to hardwire that way. And therefore, the places in our lives that we, ha we struggle the most are often the places that we are scared of the most. The Queen of Hearts, a fictional character and the main antagonistic in, both, in all the books of Alice in Wonderland, She's childish, she's foul-tempered, and she, even Lewis Carroll, the author, describes her as a blind fury. She is quick to give death sentences at even the slightest of offenses. I have, this is, this is interesting, I'm using Alice in Wonderland. I have never liked the book. <laughs> I know. And for years, I could, I've never really looked at why I don't like the book. How many of you said, I don't know why I don't like it, I just don't like it? Exactly. That's where I was at. And this week, Alice in Wonderland showed up so many times, I thought, all right, universe, let's just look at this. The Queen of Heart rules over Wonderland, and she's a tyrant, and she's violent, and she's authoritative, and she's dominant. She likes to play croquet with live flamingos and hedgehogs as mallets and balls but only when she wins and by her own rules, and she constantly orders the beheading of people when something isn't to her liking. She has her own idea about how trials should be conducted and is feared by everyone in Wonderland. She has no patience and she is explosive. Well, that's my mom. No wonder. At least that's the story I used to have about my mother. And it's true that my mother was definitely just like the Queen of Hearts in many ways. It was really difficult in my household to figure out really what was right or wrong, but it was really based on what she believed was right or wrong, which could change at any moment. So it was interesting as I was reading it this week, I was going, my goodness, I lived with the Queen of Hearts. This makes perfect sense. My mom's rage and her actions made no, so, no sense to me as a child. And I remember reading Alice in Wonderland. It was part of the reading when you were a child, and I really disliked it. I was afraid in it. And then it just became, well, I just don't like it. But the real idea is I carried that idea of my mother being the queen of hearts into my adulthood. And when you read the story of Alice, you see how much power this woman has. What's interesting is Alice stands up to her throughout the whole book. She's never afraid of her. She continues to challenge her. And when she says things that Alice, that, and that Alice doesn't agree with, Alice says, well, that's not true, or that's not right, or I don't agree with that. And I find that to be so interesting because that is not what I learned from my Queen of Hearts. But Alice did not grow up with a Queen of Hearts. She met the Queen of Hearts. At some point in my young adult years, without realizing it that, about the Queen of Hearts, but realizing that the only way that I could move into my young adult years, or I should say move through my young adult years, into really having some sense of self was I had to stand up to the idea of what I believed about her. Because no matter what I believed about my mother at the time, it was 
how I placed myself in that story, and I continually told the story of being the victim to my mother even into my adult years. And it wasn't until I finally faced my queen of hearts that the story changed. When I started to look at really what was my mother's journey, when I started to remember diagnoses of mental health as I was growing up, and I started to understand more about what and how, where she was coming from, that I realized that I was no longer sort of one of the court members of the Queen of Hearts. The story started to change. And I started to become the hero in my story rather than a victim of off with her head, which was what I was always afraid of. Even though she didn't have that, she didn't have that same power as an adult. One of the things that I found through this whole process with respect to facing the queen of hearts was the fact that the thing that we often avoid is the very thing we must run to. Can you put up, um, the Alice through the looking glass, the second slide. You see, that's the effect of living backwards, the queen said kindly. It always makes one a little giddy at first. Living backwards, Alice repeated in great astonishment. I never heard of such a thing. But there's one great advantage in it, and that's one, that one's memory works both ways. Well, isn't that interesting? How does our memory work both ways? She says, I'm sure mine only works one way, Alice remarked. I can remember things, I can't remember things before they happen. It's a poor sort of memory that only works backward, the queen said. Stories change because we come to understand new information. Our memories change from the future because we find out more and more about the truth of who we are and the truth of the situation. The story can change. And the story must change. As we're going through this unification, any of our fears that come up are all coming up because of stories we have. Stories we have about who am I, stories we have about who you are, and who you are, and what this situation or experience means. And we will always, always interpret facts based on who we are. We see the world not as it is, but how we are. That doesn't mean there's not injustice in the world. Let's just put that aside for just a moment. But the point is, any story that we have where we're a victim is seeing the world from where we are, period. Because there are no victims unless we choose to accept victimhood. And by the way, with victimhood, you've heard the phrase, hurt people hurt people. Victims hurt people unconsciously, because we're living from the story that somehow we are a victim of something to which we're not. Would you put that, leave that quote up for me, Dale? Thanks. Uh, actually, go to the next quote, Dale. Alice goes on in the story with respect to the fact that we often think, so just imagine for a moment, don't read the quote. Okay, don't read it. Look right here. <laughs> it's like a shiny object, right? <laughs> Ever since I learned to read, you put something in front of me and I'm going to read it. Sometimes we think that we're the only normal person in the room. Yeah, you're laughing. Yeah. <laughs> normal is a myth. There's no such thing, and there's no way we know more than anyone else. We may be a little more conscious sometimes, but there is no way that anyone is more normal than anyone else. So Alice, in, look, through the looking glass, looks up and sees the Cheshire cat. And she says, but I don't want to go among mad people. Oh, you can't help this, said the cat. We're all mad here. I'm mad, you're mad. How do you know I'm mad, said Alice. You must be, or you wouldn't have come here. 
You get where I'm going with this? <laughs> that we're here on this planet when we think about the lessons that we're learning and what we're being challenged by. Even this very beautiful process of potentially unifying. So I'm going to ask a question in the room. How many people have said or believe it's already done? Mm -hmm. It's not, by the way. It's not. You know why it's not done? Someone tell me, why is it not done? It's a process. There's one. We haven't done it yet. Too many pieces and parts. I'm looking for a specific action that says, thank you. We haven't voted. And when I say we, I don't mean me. It is not up to me. It is not up to John. It is not up to the boards. It is up to us. And it doesn't happen until we say yes. That is the power of creation. And if we say, well, it's already done and people already figure, you know, if we do that, then what we've done is we've removed ourselves and the power that we have in the world. It's up to us to step in with our voice and create a new story of a new creation. And that takes everyone. And it's not done. And it's not done, and it's not done. And by the way, even after the vote, it's still not done. Because the story doesn't end. I'm going to close with, a, with a, a book that I would suggest you pick up. Sarah Pulley is the director, producer for a movie that's just come out called Talking Women. I haven't seen it yet. I'm waiting to be in the right mood. Stories like that, I need to be in a particular frame of mind. She wrote a book called Running to the Danger, and she contemplates her own stories ranging from stage fright, childhood neglect, sexual assault, to high-risk childbirth, to endangerment of a host of reasons. And she says about, in writing this book, these are the most dangerous stories of my life, the ones I've avoided, the ones I haven't told, the ones that have kept me awake on countless nights. As these stories found echoes in my adult life and then went another, better way than they did in childhood, they became lighter and easier to carry. The reason she wrote the book is she had a traumatic brain injury. She had a concussion where the symptoms were so severe they lasted for three years. That is not unusual, by the way. And so a doctor told her, doctors before their final doctor told her, if, if you're light sensitive, stay in the dark. If no, noise sensitive, stay away from noise. If exercise hurts, stay away from exercise. And this doctor said, run to the danger. The only way, he said, because we have to retrain your mind, your mind has been trained to be sensitive to the very things that will help you heal. Do you get me? So the, for three years that she had those migraines and nausea, extreme light noise sensitivity, the specialist came together with her with other specialists to recover, and she retrained her mind by charging towards the very activities that triggered her symptoms of headache, fatigue, sensitivity, you name it. Sometimes when we listen to our body and it's malfunctioning, we are interpreting what it's saying, but because of the stories we carry, we are listening to the wrong message. That's why sometimes we go, well, wait, what do I do here? And that's why I always encourage people, do not try to figure things out by yourself. It's the worst thing you can do because you're going to figure it out from the story you're living with, which is why it's good to talk to a practitioner who will help you dismantle the story. Polly, in her book, she talks about this Rather than living in a, protect, a protective cr uh, crouch, she decided to run to the danger, and she decided to do it with all the stories that were keeping her debilitated. In my own life, I ran towards the queen. And the relationship that I ended up with in my mother at the very end was reconciled. 
She did not change. I did. I did. I no longer was afraid. I ran to the monster that I created out of her and continued to live with in my adulthood. I went after things that made me nervous. I did that my entire adult life as I tried and worked and struggled sometimes with the stories that I carried with me into my adult life. And any time I am afraid of something, with exception of skydiving, <laughs> maybe not this life, I ran towards it. I ran towards it and pulled the curtain away to see what was truly there. We must learn. Would you put up the last slide, Dale? We must learn to run into the discomfort instead of away from it. The things we avoid get bigger over time, and we have trained our brain to be in the world we've created. We have indeed created the world we're in. We had a lot of help, no doubt. Parents, teachers, folks, friends, and all of that. But that does not give us license to sit in victimhood unless we want to accept that. So in our life, if we think we haven't been heard, what do we do? Do we continue to affirm that we are not heard, or do we make sure that we're heard? Sure we're heard? Exactly. If we feel we haven't been seen, do we continue to be invisible? No. no. We become visible for ourselves. We run towards the things that scare us. We speak out. We challenge old beliefs. And through this process, what would it be like to challenge the beliefs that I have about myself? Because guaranteed, if you pay a little bit of attention through this, you will find that how you view this, how you view others, how we view ourselves and others, is informed by the stories that we refuse to let go, that we refuse to open up to a greater truth. This week, Janine and I sat with a therapist and talked about the information that we found. And the first thing she said to me was, now, Bobby, don't get so catastrophic. <laughs> and then she helped us walk through to exactly what was going on and gave, helped us with a path. So I lived with that potentially catastrophic story for about 24 hours. That's it. And that's as far as I'm willing to go anymore. Speak our truth. Be seen. Be heard. Look at our stories. It's up to us. I'm going to offer up a prayer. So as we come together in this beautiful sacred space, it is sacred because we're here. It is sacred because as divine beings, everywhere we stand, the ground is sacred. The earth is sacred. All of creation is sacred. All events, situations, and circumstances are sacred. And we hold these as everything is God, spirit, universal mind. We know that we're one with it. We anchor in that belief right here and right now. This week, now, right this moment, any story I have about another or myself, I open up to a much bigger story and allow it to continue to transcend and transform. I hold this as the one very thing as humans that we are able to do. We are able to change it. We are able to change the world through the stories we tell. So the stories we begin now to explore and tell are ones that we are the hero. We are not victims, no longer. I anchor this truth knowing this is truth about each person in this community, the community of Namaste, and the communities, every spiritual community on our planet. Holding this truth, I say thank you. And so it is. Amen. Thank you.